So we are talking about the nutritional support. This is the first section of this presentation in which we will talk about the stimulants of the stress response. The stimulants we are going to talk about include hypovolemia or end organ hyperperfusion. Then we will be talking about tissue damage, pain and determinants of host response to stress. And finally, we'll get an idea about the body composition in general, as well as comparative. Then we'll talk about the nutritional status and age and gender. So starting off with hypovolemia and N organ hyperperfusion. So this is a very good flow diagram, which would help you understand the need of nutrition and how hypovolemia and N organ hyperperfusion affects a patient. So there are pressure receptors in the aortic arch and the carotid bodies. These are volume stretch receptors. There are also volume stretch receptors in the left atrial wall. Now, both of them, they detect an acute drop in circulating blood volume as well as the blood pressure. When they detect, they send these signals to the brain. Now, the, this activation of the sympathoadrenergic axis, this activation causes a rise in the stroke volume to maintain a perfusing, <coughs> a perfusing pressure. And this happens at the expense of tachycardia. So when there's detection of low volume or low pressure, the stretch receptors in the atrial walls, as well as the pressure receptors in the aortic arch and the carotid bodies, they send the signal to the brain, which causes activation of the sympathoadrenergic axis. This sympathoadrenergic excess causes tachycardia that increases the heart rate and as a result of which the hyperperfusion which was initially there is corrected and now the tissues are being adequately perfused. At the same time, the brain acts on, uh, the brain causes the release of antidiuretic hormone and causes uh, eld when produces aldosterone. These acts on the kidney and these cause a, in, uh, resorption of water and electrolytes as a result of which the volume also increases. This causes a restore of the circulate, restoration of the circulating plasma volume. So this is how the hypovolemia and end organ hyperperfusion is corrected in the human body. Now, if not treated, this would lead to anaerobic metabolism and lactic acid production that would lead to metabolic lactic acidosis. So there's another pathway that can occur <coughs> if this is not corrected and that will lead to lactic acid doses. So, so what, how does the tissue damage uh, take place? Now, the principal factors that can se set stress into motion, this one of them is the tissue damage. Hypervolemia in itself is really an adequate <coughs> stimulus to trigger a hypermetabolic response. So what is a hypermetabolic response? Whenever there's an insult or an injury to the body, the body tries to compensate for it by increasing its metabolism. So the, the, the con consumption of oxygen is increased. There's increased amount of production of carbon dioxide. So the body goes into a state of <coughs> hypermetabolism to, so as to produce more and more energy so that the insult can be leveled with or fought off. Now, this, if there's prolonged hyperperfusion, this can lead to cellular death. The cellular death is responsible for the release of toxic products. Now, these, this release of toxic products will produce the stress response. So hypovolemia in itself is not sufficient for the production of hypermetabolic response, but the damage to the tissues and the production of these harmful substances are responsible for the hypermetabolic or the stress response of the body. So how does the pain come into play? So it is an important activator of the sympathoadrenergic response. So the sympathetic and the adrenergic response is 
produced by the pain that is perceived at the site of the insult. It leads to a catecholamine surge with the metabolic effects of the catecholamine. So the body enters the fight or flight response and there's a metabolic surge in the body. This local tissue, uh, the local tissue destruction is actually what is perceived as pain. So what exactly is pain? There is destruction of the local tissue and that is perceived as pain. It tri triggers numerous efferent pathways which prepare the body for fight or flight response. I've talked about it. The sympathoadrenergic pathway is responsible for the fight or flight response of the body. So it triggers numerous pathways. This, uh, the pain, it triggers numerous efferent pathways which prepares the body for fight or flight. Now, what are the determinants of the host response to stress? Now, a stress is there on the body and how would the host respond to it? So they are idiosyncratic in nature the intensity of duration of the stress response may vary so they come together and they amalgamate upon each other as a result of which they may increase the intensity and duration of each other and this is directly proportional to the amount and duration of stress that is acting on the body greater the amount and duration of stress that acts on a body uh, the, the greater is the response of the body towards that stress. Now the determinants of host response, they are determined by the genetic traits and the certain environmental parameters involved as well. Now these include the bodily composition. So the major determinant of the metabolic response, which is seen in acute phase after um, a surgery or an accidental trauma is the body composition. So how does that come into play? The post-traumatic uh, nitrogen excretion is increased and is directly proportional to the size of the lean body mass. So in the post-traumatic period, the body uh, it tries to use its protein up to form the new proteins required. Sometimes the body is not being nourished very well. Even if the body is being nourished very well, there is, uh, this, there is destruction of the bodily proteins to build up new proteins. Now, this production, the, this post-traumatic um, nitrogen excretion, uh, which the nitrogen is excreted by the protein in the body, by the breakdown of protein in the body, it is directly proportional to the <laughs> size of the or the amount of protein that is present in the lean body. That is greater the amount of protein, the muscular the individual are, the greater the uh, stores of nitrogen, so they would not dwindle with post-traumatic nitrogen excretion. A balance between the nitrogen intake and the nitrogen output is a, use, is a useful marker of the protein metabolism. So whenever, in, uh, whenever you're dealing with a post-traumatic or a post-surgical patient, you try to balance out the protein intake and the protein output. It is between a value of minus 2 and plus 2, the protein equilibrium is established. And this is very important for protein metabolism. Greater muscle, uh, muscle mass due to great long-term physical activity has advantage during acute surgical illness and starvation because it provides major fuel to the body and helps the body to form new protein. So it helps the body in getting better. Now, excessive adiposity may affect the outcome after intense stress due to abundance of the pro-inflammatory precursors. So, in an, adipo, in an obese individual, there are the, the, the lots of pro-inflammatory inflammator, uh, pro inflammatory precursors. These pro-inflammatory precursors are activated in, uh, in response to stress to the body as a result of which the um, healing of the body is complicated and the effect is, um, the, the effect is not as good as in a lean body. 
So what is the baseline nutritional status of the patient? This is a very important marker. As a good baseline nutritional status, a patient having a healthy lifestyle and a healthy nutrition, it would be easier to perform an elective or an emergency procedure on that. The body would be well equipped to deal with the emergency or uh, the elective procedure and uh, there would be lots of stores of nitrogen to be used. However, in an undernourished or an improperly nourished, be, whether it be a, a thin lean in the, a thin individual or an obese individual, there would be a lot of pro-inflammatory markers as well as in a lean individual, there would not be sufficient substrate for the energy production. In an obese individual, there would be lot of inflammatory pro-inflammatory markers so the response to the um, response to surgery would not be as good so baseline nutritional status is very important there exists a strong relationship between the pre-operative pr protein depletion and post-operative complication so there's a direct relation greater the pre-operative protein loss in the disease the greater the chances of developing complications Protein depleted patients, they have lower pulmonary strength and reserve. They are more susceptible to infectious complications. The wound healing in them is impaired and they are in the hospital for a longer duration. So these are some of the factors that, um, that uh, affect the outcome in a, uh, in a patient, in a post-surgical patient patient now how do the age and gender come into play so here on the x-axis we have age in years on the y-axis we can see the bone mass which is the total mass of skeletal calcium in grams so uh, this pink is the female curve and this blue is the male curve so you can see as the age increases the bone growth has is increasing now the total mass of calcium is increasing it reaches a maximum at 30 years of age in females and and about 45 years of age in males it's it's actually a plateau in males it also re reaches a peak about the same time about 30 years in males as well this is the peak bone mass in the in the in males as well as the females so after the achievement of this plateau in males and this females um, the, the, there's slow convergence there's slow decrease in the plateau as the age progresses however in the female curve you can see a sudden dip this sudden dip uh, appears after 50 years in between 15 60 years of age this is the time of the menopause in females. So estrogen has a protective effect on the bone density and helps to maintain it. Now, after uh, when the influence of estrogen is lost after menopause, the bone density tends to dwindle and decrease. So similar is the case. The, uh, the muscle mass of the women also increase uh, postmenopausally as well. Uh, as the bone mass in men there's no such decrease there, there's gradual decrease however this decrease this alteration in the body composition with age is very important as whenever you are dealing with the patient um, if you have to perform an emergency uh, surgery or an elective surgery you need to have an idea of the uh, underlying physiological conditions of the patient's body Greater the age of the patient, patient, lesser would be the reserves of um, proteins, bones would be brittle, there would be more fat around the organ. So you should have an idea of what you're dealing with so that you can maintain the nutrition of that patient. So this was all about this section. In this section, we discussed various nutritional um, um nutrition uh, we, we discussed we talked about nutrition and the function of nutrition as a whole then we saw uh, the bodily comp uh, the various bodily alterations that occur with age and gender i hope you understood and like this section for further such sections keep watching scardia.com